Norwich is a very old city, with its roots dating back to 43 AD. Over the time it would grow and would become recognised as a city in 1094, through its life it's in war, rebellion, massacre, disaster and disease. And like so many cities of this kind, these events are said to have left something behind that will never fully leave the city. From its ancient side streets to its new shopping centres, people are claiming to see and hear things, visions and sounds from the past calling out, not wishing to be forgotten. In today's Halloween special, we will cover some of these tales, starting with Tombland, one of the oldest parts of the city. The name Tombland itself has nothing to do with burial grounds. It originates from the Old English meaning open ground, but this hasn't stopped it having its fair share of spirits. We start with the priest of Erpingham Gate at Norwich Cathedral, one of the impressive entranceways as you enter the cathedral grounds. And although a nice newly renovated area for sightseers and tourists today. This tale goes a little way to show the area's bloody past. The story was in fact lost for many years before being found by chance in 1736 in an old publication under the name A Strange Occurrence by Frederick Higbane. The story is told by a former traveller to the county who visited Norwich some 50 years before and had a run-in with a spirit. His first day passed without incident and he took a room in an inn on Magdalen Street where his attention was drawn to a strange picture on his room's wall. The room I occupied was a very old-fashioned one. Over the fireplace was a portrait, I imagine painted on the wall itself, of a very pale man with black hair habited in some sort of ecclesiastical garb and bearing the look of a Jesuit or Romanish priest. There was something about this picture that affected me very strongly. The next morning, I asked the landlord whose portrait it might be, and he could not enlighten me. After concluding his business and having some time to kill before his return to London, Frederick took a look round the city and soon found himself walking alone near the Erpingham Gate, where he saw something he would never forget. Standing in his path before him, what appeared to be the figure of a Catholic priest, off in the fading light. A slightly surprising sight, as this was a Protestant cathedral. Frederick approached, and the truth became all too clear. Owing to the dusk, I could not see him well until I was close up against him. Then I saw him perfectly clearly, and to my horror, his face was terribly swelled, and a rope was drawn tight around his neck. Protruding from his breast was a knife, such as formerly used by executioners for dismembering the bodies of criminals. Frozen in terror, all he could do was stare at this horrible sight in front of him, but despite his shock, there was something about this figure he had seen before. I could not think why his lineaments seemed familiar to me, and then there suddenly flashed across my mind the portrait in my bedchamber at the inn. For some moments, I gazed with the utmost horror, not unmixed with fear at this awful sight. Then I heard a kind of deep sigh, a groan, and he disappeared. Brought back to his senses, he ran back to the inn where he'd been staying and up to the room. Seeing the painting again, he was sure it was the same man he had just seen. He cancelled his return trip to London and asked the landlord if there was a local Catholic priest he could speak to. A meeting was arranged for the following day. Telling him my strange adventure, he took me into his house and showed me a portrait of the same man. On my inquiring who he might be, he replied, The Reverend Thomas Tunstall, a priest, who was executed for his Catholic faith in 1616, at the gates of the very street on which your inn is situated. Thomas Tunstall was indeed a real Catholic martyr, and had originally been arrested and held in Wisbeach Castle, before escaping and fleeing to Norwich to seek help from Lady Alice Elstrange, but was turned in by her husband. Rearrested and imprisoned in Norwich Gaul, this time there was no escape. He stood trial and was sentenced to death on the 12th of July, 1616. His death would come the following day by method of hang, drawn and quartering. A witness who was there at the time of his death would say the following. The lookers-on, who were very numerous, and among them many persons of note, were all sensibly affected by the sight of his death. Many shed tears and all spoke kindly and compassionately of him, and appeared edified with his saint-like behaviour. His head was displayed at St. Benner's Gate and the rest of his body parts around the walls of the city, before they were taken taken down and buried in secret by Catholics under the altar in Bath. Sightings of the ghost of Thomas Tunstall have never been reported since then, and why he chose to manifest himself to a stranger visiting the city is a mystery. The story also sometimes goes that the judge and the whole jury that convicted him and sent him to his death were all to die shortly afterwards. Staying in Tombland, in fact, only really going across the road from Eppingham Gate takes us to one of the most famous ghosts in the city and one of the most disturbing tales in the city's history that happened in now what is one of Norwich's most photographed buildings, Augustine Stewart House. The plague came to Norwich in 1578, possibly brought by the followers who came with Queen Elizabeth I when she visited the city in August. Who brought the disease with them has become largely irrelevant, but over the next two years, thousands would die in the city in the most horrific ways possible. Such was its violence that all other distempers gave way or ran into it. They experienced the most intolerable pain from the heat of the head. The eyes were swelled and fiery, 
the tongue bloody, respiration difficult and breath fetid, vomiting of bilious matters frequent. Finally, the body became livid, with pimples here and there scattered over it, which bred worms. Death took place the second or third day. As in many other places in the country, the bad old days of the Black Death returned to the city. The dead piled high and the graveyard struggled to cope. Many areas of the city still claim to be the site of a plague pit. Those who became infected were removed from their homes and their houses boarded up for 40 days with a large red cross and Lord have mercy upon us written across it. After the 40 days ended, the red cross was replaced with a white cross and the building was left for another 20 days and then was fumigated and painted with lime. Overall, this was a very effective way of dealing with the disease and would be used again during the Great Plague of 1665. But in the now famous Crooked House, there had been a mistake. As the group of bailiffs entered the house, they found the remains of a family of three lying side by side. Why had they remained in the house when it was boarded up? We may never know. Maybe they didn't hear they had to leave and were already too weak from plague to try and break down the doors or call for help. As they began to move the bodies, they soon discovered that two, the mother and father, had evidence they had died of the plague upon them. But the daughter, who lay next to them, appeared to be untouched by the disease. That was sadly not all. Bits of the parents were missing, and their skin was marked with what appeared to be human teeth marks. The horrifying truth soon became clear. Sometime after being boarded up in the house, the parents had succumbed to the plague. The daughter, trapped, soon ran out of food, and in a desperate act to survive, she was forced to cannibalise her parents, only to choke to death on a chunk of human flesh. Ever since the house was opened, the sightings of what have come to be known as the Grey Lady of Tombland have begun. Believed to be the wayward spirit of the young girl, she is mostly seen around the Augustine Stewart house, the alley behind it, and the nearby St George's Church, where a number of plague victims of the area were buried, undoubtedly her and her parents among them. But sometimes she seems to venture further afield. She is said to be dressed in ragged grey clothes and finds her fun in moving things around, especially in the Augustine Stewart house, which is now an antique shop, where her presence is often felt. John Mills, who was the Reverend of St George's for a time, reported that while practising for an upcoming sermon one weekday, he was alone in the church when he saw the Grey Lady. She entered through the main door and walked down towards the back of the building, completely ignoring him, before leaving through the door that led to Tombland Alley, a door that hasn't been able to open in many years. Near both the ill-fated house and the church is Samson and Hercules' house. It has been many different things over its life, but from 1982 to 1999, it was a nightclub. One night, during a private function, a DJ heard a noise upstairs near the toilets. Believing it was someone trying to break in and join the party, he went to investigate. By the toilets, he found a young woman. He began to question her about what she was doing, but she ignored him and walked off down the corridor. Well, not exactly walked. As she moved away, he saw she had no legs and was gliding along the floor before turning a corner and disappearing. The most recent sighting of her was on the 18th of April 2015 when a couple were giving their dog a late night walk before going to bed when they saw a woman walking towards them. As she grew closer, they realised she was wearing a very old grey clothes and a white apron. Interestingly, they also said she wore some kind of mask covering her eyes, which hasn't been reported by anyone else. She made no acknowledgement of them, and as she passed them and rounded a corner, she seemed to vanish and was never seen again. Just a six minute walk away from the haunt of the Grey Lady is Magdalen Street, a street of shops that leads up to Anglia Square. The focus of our story though is not the street itself, but one of its buildings, number 19. It's been many different things over its 300 years of life, but in the 1870s, when our story begins, it was a pub, but could better be described as a brothel, where drinks were enjoyed downstairs and other things were enjoyed upstairs known as the Key Merchant's Arms. One day, into this house of ill repute came a woman who has come to be known as Sarah. It is believed she is one of the girls who worked there, but in what capacity it is unknown. She was described as fiery and loud. Sadly, she would find herself pressured upstairs by a man, and after refusing his advances, was strangled to death in the room that's now the attic. A tragic, but all too common end for women like her in Victorian Britain. The fate of her murderer is unclear, with some saying he escaped and has never been seen again, and others saying he was caught and hanged for his crimes. The building was never the same after that. A strange presence is often felt. Mist is seen in corridors. Sarah is still very much there. The first people who really started to take note of these strange occurrence was radio rentals. From footsteps in empty rooms, to slamming doors, and occasionally sightings. But it seems they viewed her more with pity and acceptance than as some type of terrifying spectre from the attic. And the shop would run peacefully alongside her before it closed in the early 70s. In January 1973, a man who had been secretary at Radio Rental wrote a letter to the paper about his time there. Poor, poor Sarah. If it wasn't bad enough being foully done in in a pub of ill repute, now her poor soul 
can't even find any understanding. For two years, I worked as a secretary at 19 Magdalen Street, and on many, many occasions, I was the only person in the whole locked up building. There I would sit, tapping away on my typewriter, on the first floor front, with an empty, boarded up shop on one side, and a closed on Thursday afternoon on the other. Oh yes, Sarah was certainly around. Footsteps, drafts, all that, but no clanking chains. But even though I didn't think I would ever run screaming, she didn't favour me with a personal, full frontal visitation. Pity, really. We could have had a nice chat together. With the place standing empty, the charity Oxfam moved in, using it as their headquarters in the city from 1972. And much like those before them, they soon came to realise they were not alone. Only this time, things would not be so friendly from the part of Sarah. It would begin like it had time and time again for the previous residents. The footsteps and the knocks were the occasional glimpses of something. One morning, workers came in to find a pile of donated women's clothing that had been left on the floor the day before, had been moved and were neatly folded and stacked on a table. Although all this activity was very benevolent, they soon found it hard to keep volunteers on at the building due to the strange goings on. In search of an answer, a paranormal investigation group, the Borderline Science Investigation Group from Lowestoft, spent a night in number 19 to try and communicate with Sarah. They would write a report of their findings in the magazine The Lantern. We did not have to wait long before the lights in the front showroom were unexpectedly turned off and the source of the light had to be physically reinstated. A little while later, I was in the upstairs toilet when, to my astonishment, the originally locked door swung violently open with no apparent physical explanation. But no one was there to substantiate this. As if this wasn't strange enough, a tape recorder picked up a woman's voice saying something like, we know you're there or who's there. It may have been a successful night for the researchers, but it was evidently a very unpleasant one for Sarah and made her feelings known to the shop's manager a while later. One day, he was walking through the shop when he felt like hands gripped each of his legs and he was frozen to the spot, unable to move his legs no matter how hard he tried. In front of him, a rack of clothes began to move across the room and a blue mist formed above them before floating up the stairs towards the attic. But, as with the residents before them, Oxfam soon moved out, with there even being reports of two exorcisms being performed on the building in the 1980s to try and cleanse the place and let Sarah rest in peace. These would seem to have been less than successful. A pet shop that took up residents in the 90s didn't last long, with smaller animals dying for no apparent reason and dogs refusing to enter. Even a fire exit sign that was fixed to the wall was thrown across the shop and hitting the owner, sending them to hospital for x-rays. They left shortly afterwards. During the building's time as a travel agent, Holiday brochures were often claimed to be flying through the air like confetti, and one former employee described the whole thing as a bad time. As the new millennium came in, Sarah had the place to herself for a while, before a new temporary resident would set up an antique shop for a short time. There would be no violent activity or any sightings, but the owner repeatedly found a set of cushions that had been placed on a sofa had been turned face down every morning. Residents after this have reported little, but even so, they have decided not to take their chances. In 2006, the tenant at the time was interviewed by the local paper. I have sat here in the evenings and I don't sense anything. I will only believe it if it happens to me. If it was a violent ghost, I wouldn't be so happy. But she is meant to be friendly. I even say goodbye to her when I walk out the door. And I was going to put a bundle of clothes out to see if she'd sort them. There has been no news of Sarah from the current tenants that I've been able to find. But those before them reported a customer practically running from the shop in shock after seeing something in the side room. Maybe Sarah is just keeping her head down for a year or two before having a little fun again. Our final story of today takes us away from the older streets of Norwich to Chapelfield, a shopping centre opened in 2005, which sits on the site that was Clary's Chocolate Factory. It's not exactly the place you would expect to hear of paranormal encounters, but there have been sightings, rather than in person, on the building's CCTV cameras. Two videos taken from the camera system were uploaded to YouTube by user PC333 that claim to show strange goings on around the building. The full videos can be found in the description. Both were uploaded on the 30th of October 2011. The first shows one of the main doors on the second level to the shopping centre flying open, sending a warning cone sliding across the floor. The description on this video reads as such. Please see the footage and watch the cones. This footage is inside Chapelfield Shopping Centre, Norwich, UK. This was recorded at 4.40am with no people around apart from the cleaners and the weather outside was normal. The doors are very heavy and shut automatically unless held open. I used to work in this mall and crazy things happen all the time. In fact, there is a history in this mall as well as a well under one of the shops and 10 bodies were found inside the well and those were 400 years old. Could the activity be linked? The bodies in the well the uploader is referring to is one of the darker parts of the city's history. When during the 12th and 13th century, 
Jewish people were being forcefully removed from England. In Norwich, the hatred had been growing since 1144, when a young boy was found dead in what was claimed to be a religious ritual blamed on the Jewish citizens of the city, which led to a blood libel. I plan to cover this in more detail in a main video in future, so I won't go into too much here, as a Halloween video is probably not the best place to cover it. But at some point between 1144 and 1290, when Edward I expelled all Jews from England, these 17, not 10, including at least one child, fell victim to an angry crowd and were either thrown or forced to jump to their deaths in this well. The doors you also see opening lead out to a graveyard that was partly dug up for a footpath, so there could be no end of misplaced spirits in the area. They are also very correct about the weight of those doors. They are indeed heavy, and I wouldn't think would blow open that easily. The second, far more mysterious video shows a lone red balloon, floating away from the doors in the first video, in fact, coming down a turned-off escalator before coming to rest in a cafe area. The description reads, Is this a ghost pulling the balloon down and walking with the balloon? This is one of two CCTV footage recorded in Chapelfield Mall, Norwich, UK. Think of the physics of a balloon and how they move slash float. Could be coincidence, however, there was no breeze or aircon in the building, and the escalators were switched off, which would prevent any draft. Watch and tell me what you think. This mall is known to be haunted. It certainly is a strange video that seems to have little explanation, and has been pointed out in the comments, if the balloon had been filled with helium, it would have floated to the roof, not slowly made its way down some steps. Maybe the child, unfortunate enough to find themselves a victim of the hate-filled mob, has been able to find some happiness in death they were denied in life. I have not heard of any of these hauntings in Chapelfield until researching for this video, and would love to hear more if anyone has more stories from there. We may never know what caused these two strange occurrences to be caught on video, but especially the balloon one raises a far bigger question. Has anyone checked Norwich sewers recently? As before, I would love to hear what you think of these ghost stories. There's plenty more from the city that I can cover, including one that does feature yours truly in some way, but that will have to wait for another year. Do you have any similar stories from where you live? I'd like to hear them. I find this whole thing incredibly fascinating. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Feel free to subscribe and like if you wish. This was Ghost Stories of Norwich. And although legends, they are a little bit of history.